Happy International Women's Day to all. Today, you will hear from an esteemed group of women leaders in science and technology who are cracking the code for a gender equal future. I am Mary Luke, Vice President of the Board of UN Women USA, and our co-host is Fazila Abdul Rashid, a new board member, partner at Revolution Growth, and a strong advocate for women and girls. Fazila, over to you. Um, so, you know, just carrying on from what Mary said, I'm truly excited for today. Um, in my day job, I am a tech investor, so this topic is dear to my heart as we look for more women that I can support as a investor who are breaking the code and cracking the code in STEM. Um, let me walk through the, um, the events for today. We will start with Mary providing an introduction of UN Women um, and our efforts on the ground where we have uh, presence as well as the various efforts we have around STEM and supporting technology on the ground. This will be followed by a very exciting fireside chat um, with an esteemed group of panelists and moderator. And I will introduce them when we start that panel. And last but not least, we will have a keynote speech by Dr. Sian Bylock. She is currently the president of Barnard and the president-elect at Dartmouth University and a cognitive scientist by training. So we have a rich program for one hour today and I'm really excited for us to kick it off. So Mary, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Fazila. Uh, let's have the, the uh, next slide, Kaylee, please. Thank you. So UN Women USA is a not-for-profit organization in one of 13 national committees that is a partner to support UN Women's global work. Our role is to educate, advocate, and fundraise for UN Women's programs around the world. We're a membership organization, and we welcome new members to join, to learn more, and to support UN Women's work. UN Women is a global champion for gender equality. Next slide, please. Its mission is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls so they can fulfill their potential. Achieving STG 5 is UN Women's key focus in the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, as it specifically targets gender equality and advocates for equal opportunities for women and girls' development. UN Women also hosts the Commission on the Status of Women, which takes place every year at the UN and is actually going on right now. Next slide. This is the first year that UN Women, uh, that the CSW has ever focused on innovation and technology in its 67 year history. It's about time. Why are only 28% of engineering grads women? Only 22% of workers in AI are women, and less than one third of the tech workforce are women. Also of great concern is that 22% of women in tech consider dropping out because of the gender pay gap and sexual harassment at work. We need to change the culture and norms that stereotype roles and limit the aspirations of girls and women. Motivating girls to engage in science and technology is a very important first step. These young women were part of a workshop organized by UN Women in the Arab States and UNESCO to inspire them to go into STEM careers. Here they are proudly showing off their robots. However, STEM education is not enough especially if women continue to drop out due to the hyper-masculine workplace culture. There is a need to fill the pipeline at every level with women leaders like our esteemed speakers today who mentor and open the path for more women to succeed and grow in this fast changing world. Next slide, please. Although the digital revolution has offered huge opportunities to improve lives, we must acknowledge the risk and reality of online abuse and threats to women and girls' safety. 
A study of 51 countries revealed that 38% of women had personally experienced online violence. Another big risk is the per perpetuation of gender stereotypes and biases in artificial intelligence, given that most AI developers are men. How can we harness the, harness the power of technology to promote gender equality? There has been much discussion at the UN this week about the need for a normative framework, including international policies and standards that respect women and girls' rights. To maximize the full potential of the digital transformation, women must be included in the formulation of policy and in every step of product design, development, and execution. Dylan Osguler, pictured here, is an adolescent girl leader who is part of a group formed by UN women to give young women an opportunity to express their views to decision makers. As an advocate against femicide and online gender-based violence, Dylan S promotes digital literacy and critical media consumption. She has a deep fundamental belief that technology can change the world to be a better place and wants to be involved in shaping its future. A UN Women's study in 2022, next slide please, has concluded that women's exclusion from the digital world has shaved $1 trillion from the GDP of low and in middle income countries in the last decade. Bridging the digital gender gap is not only a gender and human rights issue, it is also an economic imperative. We cannot wait 286 more years before gender equality becomes a reality for our great, great, great grandchildren. Internet access must be open to the 2.5 billion users who lack access now, many of whom are women and girls. So they can be part of the digital world. Diverse voices and talents of women and young people must be included in dis that discriminate against women and girls and leave them behind. We need your collective leadership and commitment to make the digital world safer, more inclusive, and equitable. Please join us. Donate at unwomen.org or text to donate at 1-917-924-8065. Now, thank you so much. And let's turn to Fazila to introduce our speakers. I'm on mute. I was going to say thank you, Mary. Um, really, you know, this is why uh, Mary and I are part of this organization because we touch so many lives and hopefully uh, with your help, we'll touch even more. Um, I'm very excited to open up this panel now. I'm going to do a very quick introduction as they'll do better justice to their backgrounds. Um, we have as our moderator for today, Sarah Day Barton, expert partner at Bain and Company and a member of the innovation and design team with a lot of uh, focus in design thinking and innovation in her practice with an esteemed background herself. Followed by our two esteemed panelists, Dr. Carolina Barcenas, who's currently the head of platform of data science at Airbnb with a 25 year career in the space um, with experience in places like Visa as well. And Megan Nakra, senior manager, product health science and wellness at ENY and a biotechnology uh, by, uh, biotechnologists by training. So two very esteemed women in terms of their background as a panelist uh, with Sarah moderating and I'll turn it right over to you, Sarah. I gotta unmute. Uh, hi, this is fantastic. Um, thank you, Fazila. I am uh, obviously very excited to be here today to moderate our fireside chat and uh, deeply motivated just given the theme of International Women's Day yesterday and uh, this this purpose, um, I, I, uh, I, I think what we'll do is we'll spend 20, 25 minutes um, and we will focus on innovation for the future and specifically on cracking the code for gender equal access to technology 
and career building in STEM. And the three of us, Carolina, Megan, and I, uh, we share a collective deep commitment to gender equality, um, a hugely gross bias uh, towards women, and we're each inspired to make as big an impact, frankly, as we can in the fields of innovation and technology. So this really is a wonderful opportunity for us to inspire others uh, with our own lessons and observations from the personal experience of being in this industry. So with that, why don't uh, we kick off with introductions and uh, we'll start with Carolina. Why don't you, Carolina, introduce yourself and share sort of your journey for how you got to where you are today. And in that, why don't you focus on specifically what has inspired you to keep making progress and pushing forward? Carolina. Thank you, thank you so much, and uh, good good morning, afternoon, wherever you are, wherever you are. Um, it's a pleasure being here with you, uh, Megan, Sarah, and, and uh, the UN Women for organizing this and shining the spotlight on on a very important issue. I am currently the head of platform data science, uh, as Sarah mentioned, and before that, I was actually heading the research organization at Visa where we were looking at uh, issues like blockchain and uh, artificial intelligence and security. But talking about how I got here, I, I can say that as, as a kid, right? I grew up in Mexico, I'm Latin American, and um, I was always very curious about how the world worked and how nature worked. And I really wanted to understand how to model phenomena and that took me to you know, this path of, I thought that studying physics was going to be the answer. I got my degree in physics. I realized that was not the answer, but I did fall in love with modeling and that's really what I do now. So I'm a machine learner and uh, it's all the hype around artificial intelligence. So it's a great time to be in this field, but it was really the, the uh, that curiosity that I had as a kid. And, uh, and the support of many to continue in that path that brought me where I am. I'm um, an expert in payments, risk. I've always been in the uh, tech area. So that's a little bit of uh, my career. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Megan. Hey, thanks, Sarah. And thanks uh, to UN Women USA for this platform. I have a little bit of a cold, so I'm getting over that right now. So my throat is a little scratchy. But um, my name is Megan Nakra. My pronouns are she, her. My mission is to empower teams to execute on a strategic vision through collaboration and through continuous improvement with product strategy. And I feel like my entire uh, moments of learning up until this point have helped me get to a product mindset so that I can be a strategic contributor to um, health science and wellness organizations as a whole. Uh, growing up, I, I loved science. I had a mother who stressed science and math and it showed. I went into science myself, um, did a master's in biotechnology, went into R&D laboratories and actually sitting there as a scientist with pipettes, the whole deal. Sometimes you see that in movies. It's, it's a real thing and it's a great experience. For me, however, I think I needed something a little bit more fast paced that required a lot of human interaction. And at that time, it was my mother again and my sister who encouraged me to go into technology consulting. And it's been a world, wonderful whirlwind since joining. And I get the opportunity to go into various clients, learn their problems, and look at how we can solve those problems with technology enablements. And again, using a real product mindset. At the same time, while I was transitioning from science into technology, I've done a lot of work in nonprofit health spaces. And I've been able to use a, techno a science background, applying what I've learned as a nonprofit board member and really put those together <clears throat> to be able to be a product uh, manager and product director. So really excited to be here and talk about uh, leveraging all of those as we go forward. Excellent, excellent. Okay, and just briefly on me, I, um, I'm i Sarah, I am based in the Bay Area, and uh, frankly, that is where innovation and technology are essentially baked into our everyday uh, living rhythms. Uh, I started my career at Bain & Company. I left actually pretty quickly because I yearned for 
a more operational role. And so I joined Gap Incorporated and spent almost 10 years in retail. And I did a variety of strategy slash operational roles. And then I had my first at bat to come back to Bain, uh, which is a very entrepreneurial culture. And at that time, we uh, had very nascent centers of excellence. And so I set up the customer strategy and marketing center of excellence. And, and then about 10 years ago, was asked to co-found or it sort of came out of the commercial needs of our clients, um, the, the pull for digital transformation and product management and innovation. And so I co-founded the business that's today called Innovation and Design. And it's an incredibly dynamic environment. We are focused on customer-led transformation, deeply centered in the user. And, and, and we also spend quite a bit of time helping our clients incubate new ideas and, and launch new ventures. So um, I the common thread in my career has been a deep passion for humans and especially users and customers or consumers and really thinking about technology, uh, adoption and engagement with a user-centered bias. So that's me. I, um, I wanted to just pick up on a couple of things actually that I heard in the, in the introductions and, and actually maybe Megan will come back to you. I'm specifically curious about mentors and who and how you have found mentors in your career and what type of work it, the non-for-profit sort of extension to what you do today is really interesting to me um are you mentoring others through that relationship yeah absolutely mentors and really champions and sponsors, right? Three different types of roles are really critical, especially for women and women of color as we come up into technology and science careers. And I've been really lucky, honestly. Um, when, I, when I first came into consulting, I had two really great male leaders who invested and guided me. And since then, I've had a plethora of, of people who contributed. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that formal mentorship, right? Not a regular, I'm meeting with you on a quarterly basis, this is what I'm trying to achieve. It's typically taking the moment, asking the right question to the right person at the right time. And you'll often receive just one line or two lines of great advice. In fact, I have a sticky note of running advice of these one-liners that I've had since I've started consulting because they ground me and they anchor me and they've allowed me to grow and extend myself and feel more comfortable with my growth. A lot of times I've just needed a space to, to grow and the right people have shown uh, provided those spaces to grow. From a nonprofit standpoint, and just certainly with the opportunities here at EY, plenty of opportunities to match with people who want to be mentored um, and to receive mentorship as well. We also have great um, work through our Women Fast Forward initiative to mentor women and girls, both who are in beginning their careers in technology, but also just learning about science. And we, have, we also have an EY STEM app that is available to persons to learn more about science and technology. Um, that's incredible. I mean, I just, I wanna pick up. Uh, most, I was reflecting on my own mentors and most of them are men as well. Uh, and, and I have frankly deep gratitude for the lessons I've learned. And there've been many, interactions with them that are like, you got this girl. So there's just been this deeply empowering groundwork or ground bench behind me supporting. And, and, and some of the more senior women at Bain are really I iconic, sort of inspiring people to, to, to give me optimism and to motivate to, to, for me to make kind of new forerunning progress. So it's interesting. And I would just say to everybody on the in the audience how important it is to find sponsors and 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 people who care about you and and can give you those one-liners. Um Kalalina, I I know you're very involved in Latinx. I, I would love to hear more about that and specifically um, what that entails. 
Yeah, and before I go there, um, let me just share, because for me, uh, talking about mentors, there are the professional mentors, and then there are the non-professional mentors. And I have to tell you that my first mentor was my father, who pretty much said, you're a woman, I get that, but that doesn't mean that you cannot achieve what you want. And I come from a family of two brothers, I'm the only daughter, and he said, don't let the society and, and the prototypes and, and the, the place where you were raised and born right dictate what you can achieve. So to me, that's the importance of it because he probably is uh, by far one of the persons that most influenced the fact that I took the career that I took, that I believed that I could take the career that I took. Um, but I'll also say that I have been in, in interesting situations. Uh, I'll tell you another story because I like to tell stories where we were at a session at one of the companies and it was a session talking to the interns. And there was this Latin American young professional who was visiting us as an intern. And she said, you know, I want to be a data scientist and my father doesn't understand it. And my mother doesn't understand it. They're like, why are you not a teacher or, or, or a lawyer or a doctor? And she said to me, would you talk to them? Would you come and tell them what data science is so that they understand why I want to be a data scientist? So I think mentorship beyond professional mentors, right? There are many opportunities uh, along the, uh, or lives, right? To be able to influence people's career. And going back to your question on Latinx, I, I am very passionate about a few things. One is bringing more girls into STEM careers and obviously bringing more uh, Latin Americans into STEM careers. I'm part of the board of directors for Girl Star, which is an organization, it's a nonprofit for bringing science to girls in middle school, uh, elementary and high school, where I feel we can make the biggest difference. That's when we have to convince them that they can believe in themselves and, and have a, a career in technology. So I'm, I'm very involved in that. I will also want to say something that Megan and you touched on, uh, sponsorship. That is a concept that I didn't really know early in my career. And I hope everybody in this audience uh, who doesn't know what a sponsorship is, do a little bit of, of homework. Sponsorships are key for you to advance in your career. And a sponsor is very different than a mentor. A sponsor is somebody that takes a special interest in you, in your career, is a person with some power in the organization that behind closed doors will actually talk about what you can bring to the table and opens paths for you. And I have been very, very lucky, like I, I, I hear that you and uh, Megan have been in having those sponsors that believed in me and, and opened the path for, for taking me to levels where I could actually have more impact and influence. But I just wanted to make sure that everybody, you know, takes a note and say sponsorship is relevant and make sure that you double down, not just in mentors, but also in sponsors. And yeah. really take the time with it too. Like go explore your career is yours to own and take forward. I think for a while when I had transitioned into technology, I think I was waiting for someone to kind of tell me where to go and what to do. And then I realized, no, 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 wait, it's on me. I get to do that. And I'm at a firm that where I can take my dreams and interests and vision and, and apply it somewhere and create an impact. So looking at within my own firm, outside my firm, who's doing the work, who's doing something interesting, um, finding what kind of leader you want to be, honestly, is a big part of that. And so that you can take a, a concept and put it into value, really. Um, so spend some time on it. Definitely. I, I love what you had to say. Thank you. Yes, me too. And and this this is great advice and and a great um, insight into the importance of community and the importance of not feeling like you're alone. And in technology and STEM, there's so much. We're breaking barriers every day, and we're disrupting from not pursuing more traditional paths, as in law or or medicine. We're 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 doing something new, though. I do feel like it's the norm um, now to be in, in technology, but I still think there's so much energy and passion for disruption. And as a woman, you can lead and forerun and bring others along. And you absolutely don't need to do this alone. So mentors, sponsors, um, and just frankly, what I hear also from both Megan and Carolina is just believing in yourself. And so 
if I had to give advice to, to many of the participants on this call, I think are relatively early in their careers, um, I, I think it's so important to advocate for yourself, trust your instincts, and believe in, in, in your dreams. And without sounding corny, you, you've got to try new things and, and believe in yourself. Um, I, I guess I would just come back to Megan or Carolina. Is there any other advice we feel like we should leave um, the, the, the attendees with today about how you forge forward in the field of technology or, or broader disruptive innovation? You know, one thing that I think it's super important is that, and, and, and um, it was mentioned earlier today, I'm in the field of artificial intelligence, and this is the creation of products that touch your everyday lives, right? And we, we see it all the time. You see it, you talk to Siri, you talk to Google, you talk to Amazon. I mean, it's, it's everywhere in our lives and the Tesla still driving cars. And what I feel is very, very important is that you have the right people in the design table, that you have women representing women, that you have different races representing different races. Why? Because these products are actually built for those communities. And if you are, and, and we've seen some examples out there, right, where there was a team of male designers uh, designing something and they left out something very, very relevant for women's health, right? And why is that happening? Because we are not taking the seat at the table saying this technology affects everybody, which means we need to have everybody at the table designing it. So in terms of a piece of advice, right, I would say, let's think about the fact that this technology, at least in my area, where, where, where AI is, you know, very, it, it, it's, it's a hype, but it's, it's a reality right now for lives, right? That it's not just a, a, an amazing career, it's also almost like we owe it to the rest of the community to make sure that we are creating the right uh, products uh, for everybody that represent us, that represents our, our, our culture and our race. So think about that aspect as well as how do you give back to the world uh, if you have the inclination to be in technology. I love it. Human-centered design at its best. Uh, Megan? I was going to say something about hunger. And I, I think based on my experience and what I've seen from other um, people who have grown very quickly in their careers or creating a lot of impact, it's being bold, being authentic, leveraging the right connections so that you can grow and also, you know, stay hungry, stay hungry. There's so many different problems. I have uh, someone I work with in health science and wellness named Tony. He always reminds me, Megan, you're not trying to boil the ocean. There's so many things we want to tackle. Take one, drill into it, get, stay hungry about it and, and feel empowered to take action and grow. I love it. Um, okay, so we have a, just a few minutes left and I wanted to um, end with a sort of content driven question around where, where just given your perspectives in, in your particular fields, where are the opportunities for growth and, and what gives you the most energy as we think forward? Um, Megan, why don't, why don't we start with you? Sure, absolutely. So I'm in a really lucky position right now. Um, our EY Center for Excellence uh, Health Equity is currently working on a new suite of data analytics at health equity solutions. And I get to sit in rooms with passionate people and talking about health inequities and how to solve them. So just two weeks ago, we were whiteboarding personas and user journeys and talking about design for these new products and services so that we can actually focus on health inequities. So we actually used our US um, EY health equity outlook report that clearly set Clearly, we can see the increasing focus on health equity for all health and life science organizations. And the top priority across 500 leaders in these organizations is actually healthcare access and quality. So we're actually building products and solutions to, to, to actually address these inequities. And we're currently responding to new regulations. And these regulations are changing the landscape for reporting health leaders typically need reporting and data insights and predictive analytics to be able to make outcome-driven decisions. 
And so it's it's really just exciting to be part of a team to to do that work and to talk about it on a daily basis. And where we see from here, I mean, we see this continued change in the regulations as we go forward here. So we're trying to um, uh, make sure we can get ahead of those as much as possible and building a product that and service that makes sense for a lot of organizations as we go forward here. So really exciting work. Excellent, excellent. Um, Carolina. Yes, you know, um, we are, I feel right now in, in my area, right, AI, at a little bit of an inflection point, probably not crazy as like internet or, or when the iPhone broke, but but it's still going to be a point in time when we look back and we realize this whole thing with conversational AI and generative AI. And for those of you that, you know, follow some of the tech news, there's this thing called chat GPT, where like you feel like you're talking to a, a person, but it's a model. Um, now, why does that excite me? It also scares me, by the way. But let me tell you why it excites me. It excites me because there are certain opportunities with technology like that that could really change people's lives. In what sense? When I was growing up um, in, in you know, Latin America, there were remote areas where teachers didn't want to leave. And we had kids that we had to teach. And we would, you know, the government would put like TVs and there would be like these videos were probably very boring for us to expect the kids to learn, right? And what if you now, like many years later, could actually have an agent, right? Like uh, in this case, uh, these models be the ones teaching the kids in a more interactive way. It's cheaper technology, right? To, to well, those models are not that cheap, but you know, it, once we get it to the point that it's accessible, it could really bring education to remote areas, right? It could really. We're talking about how do we decrease the the gap in in you know in gender, etc it would really democratize like because i'm a big believer that education is really what's going to change right it's really what changes your 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 life and your future so that technology can actually do that it also scares me because it could also do things that are uh, not positive. So I think it's more about how do we do it responsibly and how do we use it so that we actually do good. So what I would say, if you ask me, what is what are you passionate about? AI for good. And it's so great that you mentioned AI for good because to the extent that we're working on health equities as well, try, we're thinking those big picture items that are the intersection of of those health inequities, right? So trying to reduce the costs that are associated with um, chronic illness, tracking those more effectively. There's a lot of different ways we can leverage technology and we just need to find smart ways to do it by understanding and getting to the root of most problems. Yeah, exactly. What I'm hearing is just from your angle, sort of performance tracking and using data to inform smarter outcomes. And then for Carolina, I love the tension of you know, bullishness for equality and tension with like, there's some fear baked into um, just the future of AI. I mean, from my perspective, as I, I work with many clients who frankly are stuck in doing what they've always done, um, I, I feel really bullish. And, and I think the area of, of growth is just purely embedding more risk and appetite for risk and desire for disruption in these big corporate entities, it's uh, it's harder than it would seem to embed new innovative methods or practices or even mindsets in a corporate culture. Um, and I, I see the importance of experimentation and I see the impact of, of the positive impact of trial. Um, and so I, I, I just really hope for a, a greater appetite for risk-taking and listening to the ideas and the customer's unmet needs so that corporations can actually win by innovating and appealing in a differentiated way to what those needs actually are. Uh, there's just not enough experimentation and trial today and there are so many inspiring disruptive forces in the marketplace that big corporations just must respond to and beat so anyway there's uh 
I, I want to just do a time check here. Mary or Fazila, how are we doing? Do we have time for one more question or should we wrap? I think we wrap. I see Dr. Bylock on screen, so I think we are ready for our next section. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so why don't, first of all, Megan and Carolina, thank you so much for your transparency, for your uh, real um, just desire to make change and, and for your curiosity. And I so appreciate um, hearing your lessons and experiences, and I really do hope we've inspired others. Uh, so why don't I pass it back to Fazila? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, Carolina, and Sarah. Uh, what a wonderful panel. And now I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Sian Bylock. Dr. Bylock currently serves as the eighth president of Barnard College at Columbia University and is the president-elect of Dartmouth and the first woman to be elected to that position in Dartmouth's more than 250 year history. Congratulations, Dr. Bylock, on that. Very excited for you. And I'm just as excited to hear um, what you have to say today, given your background as a cognitive scientist by training and the work that you do around brain science and some of the expertise you have on choking under pressure and really looking forward to having you share some of your insights with us. So over to you. Well, great. Thank you so much for having me. And it's just so wonderful to be with UN Women and to talk about my passion, which is how we learn how to perform our best when the pressure is on. Um, and I thought, especially with this group, um, it would be so important to really step back and talk a little bit essentially about how some of the anxieties that we often face and feel actually can come to plat pass in terms of how we perform. And it turns out that my research has shown that it's not just anxieties that we feel ourselves. It actually turns out that anxieties that others feel can actually have an impact on us. And this is especially important for young women and girls. Um, and we have shown actually that teachers and how they feel about their ability to do things like math and science can actually rub off on young women and girls, young women and girls, and change how they perform in subjects like math and actually how they think about their ability to do math. Now we've all hear, heard the stereotype that girls are not as good at math as boys. That stereotype is not rooted in any sort of neuroscientific or psychology approach. But what we have shown is that, especially in the US and many Western cultures where elementary school teachers are predominantly women, in the US, for example, 90, over 90% 90 of elementary school teachers are women. When those women have high levels of anxiety about their own math ability, this can actually rub off and change how students perform across the school year. And if we're looking to create a workforce of highly talented individuals, we need women as well as men to be able to do that. And so we've looked really early to show some of the impacts that teachers can actually have on students and start to think about how we get around that. So I'm gonna do the, um, completely um, pressurized task of trying to share my screen now. Let's see how that works. Did it, did it work? Did I get there? Can you see my screen? Yes? Yes, I can. All right, great. Um, so what I thought I'd tell you about one study that we did where we actually went into classrooms in first and second grade in a large public school system, hundreds of, of students and their teachers, and we assessed teachers' anxiety about their own math ability at the beginning and the end of the school year. So this is how anxious teachers feel about how they do at math. And then what we looked at is how the students learned across the school year. These were first graders and second graders, so six, seven, eight-year-old students. And what we found is at the beginning of the school year, it didn't matter. Teachers' math ability um, that we always took into account, but teachers' math anxiety did not relate to a student's math ability or how they felt about math. And that's not surprising because in large public school systems, especially in the US, students are assigned to teachers at random. But what we showed that was interesting was that at the end of the school year, when students, seven, eight, nine-year-old students were in classrooms with teachers who were worried about their own math ability, those students learned less math across the school year. This was true for boys and girls, but especially pronounced for girls. I'm going to show you some data. So if you look here on the y-axis, this is math performance. So up higher is better. And what we showed on the, you can see on the left is boys, on the right is girls. 
when boys were in teacher in classrooms with teachers who were anxious about their own math ability, they learned less math across the school year compared to boys who were in classrooms with teachers who were less anxious. This is true for girls as well, but the gap is even bigger for girls. And we think this tells us something important. Most teachers in the US, elementary school teachers and in many Western cultures, are women, especially at young ages. And if we are sending anxious women into the classroom, it can have an impact on how well girls and boys, and especially girls, perform across the school year. Now, we didn't look just at math performance. We also looked at girls' attitudes towards math. So we told them a story about a kid who was good at math and a kid who was good at reading. These are six and seven-year-old girls, and we had them draw the kid. And what we found is that when Girls were in classrooms with teachers who were really anxious about their own math performance. By the end of the school year, girls were more likely to draw a girl as good at, as being good at reading and a boy as being good at math. And if we couldn't figure out if it was a girl or a boy, we see this egg person on the right. We, we did like a little funnel debriefing to ask them. But what we're showing is even from a very young age, anxiety matters and anxiety of the adults around you matter. And if we are putting women in the classroom to teach our kids who are anxious about their own math ability. It's so common for people to say, oh, I'm not a math person. You don't hear anyone bragging about not being a reading person, but they brag about not being a math person. And women especially, we are setting up the next generation to not do as well in math. So what do we do about this? Well, first of all, just recognizing that this is a problem is really important. We have shown that teachers who are really anxious about their math ability spend less time teaching math during the school day. They're less likely to, to do it outside of math time. Everything is math. If you have two cookies at snack time versus three cookies, that's math. And so helping teachers think more about how they can teach math and also demystifying some of math for teachers that it is really something you learn. You're not born a math person or not. And helping teachers get that confidence in themselves can rub off and have an impact on girls. So I thought I'd start there because it's such an important point that our anxiety and our, our worries about our own performance not only affect ourselves, but they can have an impact on others. And so I want to use that to turn to this idea that it's normal to have anxieties about how we perform. In fact, everyone has them. And it's not just that helping teachers teach math can be helpful, but as we think about anxieties in our own life or worries that we have, I wanna underscore that we have to normalize that this is the case. It's okay to sometimes feel anxious and actually it can be even important in certain situations. So we often, as women talk about this idea of feeling like an imposter, that we've sort of tricked everyone into thinking that we are good enough to be at the table. And I wanna just bust a myth right now that this is only something that women or underrepresented voices feel because everyone feels like an imposter. Let me show you a very scientific graph to that 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 really plays this out. The point of this is that literally everyone feels like an imposter in some situations. Men, women, underrepresented individuals and of course it's more likely that you'll feel like an imposter if you're the only in a room. But I want to get rid of this idea that in feeling like an imposter even having anxiety is a always a bad thing. We've shown we can get teachers with anxiety to teach math better and be more successful. We don't necessarily get rid of their anxiety, but we help them learn how to teach math in a way that doesn't transmit it. We also know that when you feel like an imposter, it's actually an opportunity to look for feedback in the surroundings around you when you're coming into a new situation, to sensing the situation, to understanding it's not a sign you're going to fail. And people who don't have that humility, who don't often feel like maybe they were not, they have something to learn from those around them, don't take feedback well. They're not often the most effective leaders. So I think we have to turn this idea that imposter, being an imposter is a bad idea around and really think about the power of being a little uncomfortable for us to ask others for feedback, to get the experts around us to come in, to get the view of teams. It can actually be not a bad thing. And I'm gonna give you a little data that shows this. There's a great group of psychologists at the University of Chicago who did a study where they actually had in the US, Democrats and Republicans who 
you might have heard, sometimes have opposite views and get news from different places. They actually had them read newspapers. They gave both the Democrats and Republicans an opportunity to read a newspaper that Democrats tend to like more, the New York Times, and a newspaper that Republicans tend to like more, Fox News. And what they did was they had some people, they reminded them that they should learn as much as they could. The others, they told them, you know what, when you feel actually a little uncomfortable, that actually means you're learning. If you're always totally comfortable, you're not pushing yourself, you're not seeing things from new ways. And what they did then was see how long people read the news that they maybe weren't as much in favor of. And what they showed was that when people were told it's okay to be uncomfortable, that uncomfortableness is a sign of learning, Democrats were more likely to spend more time reading Fox News than they would when they were told being uncomfortable is not necessary. And Republicans spent more time reading the New York Times. And actually, I would argue that that's okay. It's good. So on the y-axis here is motivation to read. So more is spending more time reading. And you can see on the left here, the Democrats spent more time reading Fox News when they were told that, told that part of learning is being dis uncomfortable, seeking discomfort. And the Republicans spent more time reading the New York Times than their peers when they were told that part of learning is to be uncomfortable. So again, I'm pushing back at this idea. Sure, anxiety can have definite impacts on performance, but if we learn to think about it a little differently, we can help anxious teachers teach math better. We can help people essentially see opposite points of view, and we can liberate ourselves from always trying to get rid of this idea of being uncomfortable. And part of that liberation is how we talk to ourselves. We tend to be our own worst enemy in so many situations. And I want to put forward the idea that we can actually change how we interpret our own reactions. So it turns out that when you get the sweaty palms and beating heart, you often think, oh no, I'm gonna fail, something's wrong. But if you can get people to reinterpret that reaction, to remind them that having that sweaty palms, that beating heart is shunting blood to your brain so you can think, all of a sudden, people who were more anxious do better. And my research team actually tested this. We went into a big high school before they took a really, really important exam that was important to students for the rest of their career. And 10 minutes before that exam, we asked some of them to read passages about the power of your physiological response. If your heart is not beating, by the way, you're dead. Having a beating heart and sweaty palms, that's a sign you're ready to go. You're ready to pay attention. We had some students read passages like that, and we had other students essentially just get ready, study for an extra 10 minutes. And what we showed was that when we got students to reinterpret their reaction, think about their physiological response as a sign they were ready to go, rather than a sign they were ready to fail, they were more likely to do well on this test. And here's the data on the left. This is just if they passed this test, it was sort of an up down test. And what we showed is that when we had students reinterpret their physiological reaction, even write down how they were reinterpreting it, they were more likely to pass the course than when they just got ready for the test as usual. And they actually felt on the right, what you're seeing is they actually thought of their anxiety, that uncomfortableness as something that was more positive. So it turns out how you think, how you talk about your to yourself, how you interpret your own uh, feelings, your own physiological state really matters. And it matters so much that I'm going to put it up on the screen. Your words matter, but most importantly, it's how you talk to yourself. The longest and most influential conversation you will ever have in your life is with yourself. How you talk to yourself matters. And we tend to be so hard on ourselves. This is especially true for women who push towards perfection, who give themselves a really hard time. We often talk to ourselves in a way we would never pump up a friend, a colleague, our children, our family. We need to start talking to ourselves like we're talking to someone else. In fact, research shows that actually talking to yourself in the third person Instead of using I, I could say Sion, 
you're going to get this right because you studied, or you're going to get this right because you know more than anyone in the room or see on that sweaty palm. That means you're ready to go. It's a psychological distance. It means that the emotion of the situation is a little bit more likely to subside and you're more likely to do better. We've got to change how we talk to ourselves and we've got to change this message that being uncomfortable is a sign we're going to fail and that being uncomfortable is not good for learning because you know what? Having a little bit of that un uncomfortableness is not only okay, it's good for pushing ourselves and where we need to go. Now, of course, it's not fun to live with that uncomfortableness. So how do we get ready? How do we use it, get used to it? And it turns out one of the best ways to do that is to practice under the kinds of conditions we're going to perform under. If you have to give a talk, if you have to take a test, if you have to do something on an athletic field performance stage, the best thing you can do is practice in the conditions that you're going to perform under. Sports psychologists call this closing the gap, the gap between training and competition. You want to try and mimic the kinds of conditions you're going to see on that important day. That means if you are giving a talk, practicing in front of other people, it's very different giving that talk to yourself versus when all eyes are on you. And if no one will listen, practice in front of a mirror. Psychologists have shown for decades that mirrors make us more self-conscious. The idea is to get used to being in that uncomfortable state. And it turns out if we practice in that uncomfortable state, even if it's a little bit of what we're gonna feel, we're gonna do better. So what I've told you so far is our anxiety matters. It doesn't just matter for ourselves. It can matter for young kids, but we can help teachers turn that anxiety into something positive. And we can do it ourselves by remembering that we all feel it. We all feel like imposters. And it actually is a good sign. It helps us get feedback from the environment. We can turn it around in terms of using it to our advantage by remembering that sweaty palms and beating heart is something good but we have to talk to ourselves in a nice way. We have to remind ourselves that this is something that's gonna help us succeed rather than help us fail. And then we get ready for the stressful situation. We practice under pressure. Now, of course, we don't always perform at our best. We all have ups and downs. And so it's also important for us to remember how we think and talk to ourselves after an event we weren't so excited about. But let me leave you with a couple pieces of information. First, there's an amazing psychological phenomenon called spotlighting. Spotlighting is the phenomenon by which we pay way more attention to ourselves than other people do. You heard me right. We're paying way more attention to ourselves than everyone else. So when you think you've messed up, when you think everyone was judging you, psychological research shows that they were paying attention to themselves and probably don't remember a lot of what you did. Okay, so you don't believe me because you think everyone's paying attention to you. Let me give you an, a really great study. So researchers at Cornell University had students put on really embarrassing t-shirts and walk into huge lecture halls in the front of the lecture hall and stand there and then walk out. They then asked the students who'd worn the embarrassing t-shirts how likely is it that the people in the lecture hall are going to remember in two weeks that you walked in and stood there? The students who wore the embarrassing t-shirts said, oh, they're going to remember. They then actually asked the people in the lecture hall two weeks later. Guess what? Most of them didn't remember at all. We pay way more attention to ourselves. We spotlight compared to others. This is the phenomenon by which when you're in a meeting and you say something that you didn't think was great and you turn to your colleague later and say, oh, I really messed that up. And they're like, I didn't think so. I wasn't paying attention. People are paying way more attention to themselves. So you have got to give yourself a break. You have got to remind yourself that self-talk, that it was okay. And if it's very hard for you to give yourself a break, it's hard for me to give myself a break. I am a big fan of jotting my worries down on paper. In fact, I love the power worry. Give yourself 10 minutes to ruminate. Literally set a timer, write it down, and then be done with it. Research shows that journaling over time can be really great just for elevating mood, helping us feel less anxious. And oftentimes it's just a way to cognitively download that loop in your head. But again, remember that people are paying way more attention to themselves than you. And so most of what you might be worried about is probably not happening in reality. And then a final thing that I think is so important and really important to highlight for women in general is that we are really great at having multiple selves. We are parents, we are um, 
teachers, we are friends, we are family members, maybe we're a cook, I'm a college president, I do research. Having multiple selves is good. What that means is that when you have a bad day in one self, you can use the other one as a little bit of a psychological buffer. I have a really bad day parenting my 11-year-old and she thinks I'm the worst parent in the world. I can turn to the fact that I'm a pretty good researcher, an okay college president. It actually is psychologically beneficial to have these multiple identities. And I think as we come out of COVID, the onus is on managers and companies and institutions to recognize these multiple identities, bring them all in because we saw them for two years in everyone's living rooms. We saw the fact that people were not one dimensional. And this is such an important thing and an important thing for women really to bring to the forefront because that multiple identity is how we thrive. I am a better college president because I am a woman. I am a better leader because I am a mother. All of these things feed into who I am. And gone are the days where we're one-dimensional working selves. And here, I believe, are the days where we bring all those things together. And again, where it's okay to show some uncomfortableness and juggling in everything we do, because that uncomfortableness is actually good for performing at our best. So I'm going to leave you with, with just a few take-home points. One is that our brain and our body are so important for what we do, but we have the ability to essentially help shepherd our own thoughts. That anxiety that we feel is not just a sign that we're ready to fail, it's a sign we're ready to go. And we can find power in using that to our advantage. Whether it's helping teachers who are anxious teach their students in the classroom so that anxiety doesn't rub off on them in a negative way. Whether it's helping teachers and others interpret that that anxiety is actually not such a bad thing, that we can use it to our advantage. And then, of course, how we get ready for those stressful situations really matters. Practicing under the kinds of conditions you're going to perform under is a great way to make sure that you're used to whatever uncomfortableness comes your way. And I really think it's creating not necessarily a safe space for ourselves, but a brave space. A brave space is one where we make mistakes, where we get up from them, where we learn from failure, where that's part of the learning process. And that is what happens in our brains. Our brains learn when they get uncomfortable, when they're fire, when they have seen new situations. And so I think the key for all of us is to embrace that, to remember we're not the only ones and use it essentially to push the bounds of what we can learn and how we perform. So I will end there. Um, I know that was a lot in a short amount of time. If you'd like to hear more, I have two books that you can read and uh, a TED Talk. And um, please follow me on social. And I'm so excited to be able to talk to you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bylock. That was um, very, very helpful. I actually had a bunch of notes took down as tidbits of information, even for myself. So thank you very much. In the last minute or so that we have here, um, we just we at UN Women wanted to just bring our attention to one topic that's top of mind, I think for a lot of us. Um, on 6th of February, as that many of you know, there are earthquakes that struck 11 provinces in Turkey and Syria, and UN Women with our partners in the ground have been very involved in um, trying to help the women and girls in the ground who clearly are extremely affected. Uh, we are working with several NGOs, one of which is Women's Center Foundation, CAMER, founded in 2005, that has been working tirelessly on several key initiatives, in particular around providing aid packages for women, uh, including things like sanitary pads, underwear, and other essential items, as well as psychological support to the survivors of the earthquake. So to the extent this is something that you are passionate about and, and really would like to find a way to um, have an impact, there's a text to donate sign and uh, a link to donate as well. So very much appreciate everyone's time. I really took away a lot from the two conversations uh, and I hope it was the same for all of you on the call. We appreciate all of our panelists, moderators and Dr. Bylock for their time, their insights, their wisdom and Thank you everyone again for spending your lunch time or whatever time it is in the day where you are with us um, and have a good afternoon and happy International Women's Day, which is in my view every day and not just today and yesterday. Thank you everyone and have a good day. Bye-bye.